Welcome to our second video in a series from chapter six on beams. We're still in section one, subsection one. This is our second video labeled B. We're focusing on shear and moment for cantilevers and for continuous beams with cantilevers. In a previous discussion, we talked about the notion of starting with a full structure, such as this simple span beam supported at each end, that we can create something called a free body, where we take away part of that beam and look at what's left. Now, the only way we can legitimately do that is if we take away the right hand of this beam, we have to show on the remainder of the beam, uh, in other words, on the left hand of the beam, what the right hand of the beam was doing. In this case, we knew it was a moment in this direction, and we drew the moment that way. And from that moment on, we said, whenever we take a left free body on the right cut face of that free body, we're always going to draw M in this direction. That's going to be our starting point no matter what. And that way, when we get plus and minus signs, we'll be able to interpret what they mean because we always had a consistent point of departure, which is basically this counterclockwise arrow, <coughs> curly arrow. We could have started with a clockwise arrow. We didn't. We started with this and we're going to stick with that convention. So then we took this uniform load, resolved it into a single equivalent point force at the center of this left hand side of the beam. And by the way, normally there would be a shear force, but because we went straight to the center of the beam, that doesn't exist on this cut face and we've ignored it and left it out. So now uh, we have this moment and we're trying to depict what it's like. And we talked about the fact that if we take this beam and we load it in this manner, this is a straight line, that's a straight line. That means this is shortened, that's elongated because they started off as the same length. And basically because this is a straight line, we say the amount of fractional deformation is proportional to the distance we go away from this neutral axis. And for most materials that we use for structural purposes, the stress and the fractional deformation are proportional to each other. And therefore, the stress that's causing this deformation must be in direct proportion to the distance that we move away from the neutral axis. So we went through that argument and we said basically, um, we get a triangul triangulated stress like this with the highest compression at the top and the highest tension at the bottom and a linear variation to zero at the neutral axis and then to a maximum again on up. And this is what it looks like in three dimensions. Now we did all that and now we want to backtrack a bit. And the reason is we also want to look at the variation in this moment along the length of the beam. And when we do that, we're going to have situations uh, in fact, everywhere we're going to have shear in this beam, except right at the center point. So in this case, we've uh, created this free body from the left end of the uh, beam. So we segmented this off. We said, what is that beam doing? Well, if this free body is drawn on the left hand side of the center line of the beam, then we're going to have a shear force that's downward in this direction and we're going to have a moment that's that way. And again, these become our conventions from this day forth and forever. Once we made this decision, we will always draw the shear forces down. We will always draw this curly arrow in the counterclockwise direction. Now we take all this distributed load and we resolve it into a single point load. That's the equivalent. And now we see that these two forces, which are offset from each other, are tending to create a moment. Uh, these two forces are also not equal unless we made the slice right at the center of the beam, in which case this would be WL over 2 also. But it's not. It's something different. And so we will have a net shear force. So if we apply to this free body these equations, some of the vertical forces is equal to zero, we see that we have WL, this upward reaction, which we put in as plus. We have this downward force WX, so we put it in as minus WX. And then we drew the shear force down, so it also goes in as minus. 
and when we resolve this equation we get the shear force is equal to this reaction minus Wx. So in other words, it's almost like we step onto the beam and we have this abrupt application of a force. So the shear force jumps up to WL over 2 and then it diminishes down as we accumulate more and more of W. By the way, in the language of, of uh, calculus, this would be saying the shear force is the integral of the load curve. <clears throat> And in our case, we're just summing it, and that's exactly what the, the integral means anyway. It's a summation of a bunch of areas, basically. All right, so we see V starts high, diminishes downward as X moves across, and when X is equal to L over 2, we go through 0, and then it becomes progressively more negative. So the shear force... Variation is represented by a slo uh, sloped line with a slope of minus w. In other words, it's going downward from left to right. <clears throat> if we take the sum of the moments about this cut face, about this point, we see we have this reaction, which is tending to cause a clockwise moment. So we say plus wL over 2 times the lever arm, which in this case is x. That's the difference from different the distance from the line of action of the force to the point. So plus WL over 2 times x. This is tending to produce a counterclockwise moment. So we put minus Wx times its lever arm, which is x over 2, because the center of action for this distributed load is halfway along the length of this free body. Then we have minus M. <clears throat> It's minus because within the rules of our conventions for working out this equation, we call clockwise plus. This is counterclockwise, so we put a minus. And when we solve for m, we get this. And just as a check, we see when x is 0, that term 0, and that term 0. So the moment is equal to 0 at the end, which is what we expect because there's no agent there. It's supported by a pin joint. There's nothing to apply a moment. So M is equal to WLX minus WX squared, which goes to zero at the left end of the beam. At the right end of the beam, X is equal to L, so we have WL squared, and then minus WL squared, because X is equal to L, and that's zero. So we get zero at both ends, and we get a peak in the middle and it looks like this. <clears throat> so the actual moment curve for this beam starts at zero, goes to a peak, comes back to zero. And I've sort of extended this parabola beyond to kind of acknowledge the fact that it's part of a larger parabola that in fact goes on to infinity, but we can't draw all of that, but we want to make sure that we understand that we're kind of plucking off a piece of this larger parabola. Okay, so this is the curvature that corresponds to that positive moment. Now we can, uh, <clears throat> we mentioned before that we can do a cantilever. Here we have one off to the left, we slice off a free body, we apply V and M, and remember, we don't think through from this point on, we never think through what shear, what the direction of the shear force is, or the direction of the moment. We stick with this convention we started with of drawing the shear force down, and the moment we draw with a counterclockwise curly arrow. These were the logical things to do for the simple span, they are not logical here in the sense that they're in a different direction, but we'll realize as we go along that actually it's better to do this in a kind of mindless way where we just say we're always going to use the same convention. We're less likely to get confused. So now we take this uniform load W, multiply it times X, and that gives us the equivalent force, which is at the center of that distribution. <clears throat> so this is our free body. Uh, if we take the sum of the vertical forces, it's minus Wx because it's down. 
minus V because V is down and when we solve we get V is equal to minus WX and that says we're always dealing with negative shear forces. We start at zero at the end because basically there's no load to support there in the way of a shear force. So we start at zero and we go progressively downward uh, to reach the maximum shear force at the root of the uh, cantilever. And since the cantilever is of length A, and this is minus WX, when X is equal to A, we get V equals minus WA. Notice this is the same kind of slope. Its slope is minus WX. Same here as it was in the case of the simple span beam. If we apply moments about the cut face, M sub F, some of the M, M sub Fs equal to zero. This force is creating a counterclockwise moment, which is minus WX, the magnitude of the force, times the lever arm, which in this case is X over two. So the lever arm is from there to there. And then finally, we have to put minus M into the equation. And by the way, we've drawn the curly arrow around this face. But if we'd taken moments around the other end, M would still have to be in here because I remind you that M is the same about every point in the universe. It's one of the very powerful statements we're able to make for pure moments. So M is equal to minus WX squared over two. So again, it's an X squared dependence. It's parabolic, uh, except that um, we started at X equal to zero. So in other words, this parabola starts at zero there and it has zero slope at that point. And so it looks like this. So not only have we put the parabola there, so we have zero moment, but we've lined up the center of the parabola with that point so that we have zero slope at that point. And when X equals A, which is the length, uh, we get minus W A squared over two for the negative moment that's occurring at this root. Now, let's talk about what negative and positive mean. Uh, before that, though, let me, let me do the following. Um, sometimes we have cantilevers to the left, which look like this. And sometimes we have cantilevers to the right that look like this. Uh, moment has to be zero at the end of the cantilever, no matter what. And the center line of the parabola has to be lined up with the end, no matter what. Also, the shear force is zero at the end of the cantilever because there's no agent there to create any kind of shear force, just like there's no agent to create any moment. So our straight line goes through that point, but it always has a slope of minus W. So this is what the shear uh, diagram looks like. This is what the moment diagram looks like. Again, we've got shear variation represented by this uh, sloped line that goes downward from left to right. And we have exactly the same parabola here. Uh, so we're kind of getting the message that um, these things are consistent in how we construct them. <clears throat> okay, so just for clarity, <clears throat> this is the deformation we got with a positive moment. It's a smiley face, smiley and positive. Okay, when we have a negative moment, we get the frowny face, and that is the only difference between positive and negative moments. Now, that difference is profoundly important if you're working in concrete, because in concrete, you need your tensile steel up here or your tensile steel down there. And if you get mixed up about where it goes, your beam is going to fail instantly. So positive and negative moment tell us where we need to go put reinforcing steel. Okay, so in the process of drawing shear and moment diagrams, we need a couple of templates. One is a sloped line, which by the way, um, is arbitrary. You can choose whatever you want. And we also need a parabola and its shape is arbitrary also in that you want it tall enough that you get really good graphic indications even for situations where the moments start to get fairly small uh, but you don't want it so tall that it takes up too much space on your drawing uh, 
So you'll get a sense of what that template should look like and we'll talk about that in the next video. But for the moment, we're going to continue on um, with the whole notion of how we use a template like this. So we started off with this. We said, okay, so we got some kind of a parabola. Now we discover we can move that parabola around and do all kinds of things. So here we have a double cantilever. Um, the two cantilevers in this case are equal. We have our classic rule that the shear force at the end here is zero. And if that end is zero and the variation in the shear force is this sloped line. So we put our line through the end point and we project downward until we get to this line of the force. And likewise over here we project this line up until we get to the reaction there. And that tells us what the shear diagram looks like for the cantilevered portions of the beam. Relative to the moment, we know that the moment at the end of the cantilever is zero. And we also know its slope is zero. So we align the center line of our parabola with the end of the cantilever here. We do another parabola over here. Um, and that tells us the moment on the cantilever. Now, the cantilevers are kind of a law unto themselves. They're sticking out there. They're independent of everything in the sense that nothing else is influencing them. And therefore, they're the perfect place to go to gather information to get your process started. Rule of thumb, first thing you always do is the cantilevers. Whatever is happening between the supports is much more variable because whatever is happening there depends upon what the cantilevers have decided. In other words, this cantilever right here is creating this negative moment that's creating tension on the top, compression on the bottom, and that's getting thrown into this material. And in fact, it's basically propagated all the way through this center portion, which is going to tend to pull the positive moment that we're expecting to see between here is going to pull it downward. And if the cantilevers get long enough, they will assure there's no positive moment between those two supports. So you can't start between the supports. You have to start with the cantilevers and get as much information as you possibly can from that. So now we take this and we ask ourselves, what's happening in this zone in here? And one rule is that if this is a pin joint or a roller joint and that's a pin joint, then there's no agent at that point to introduce any kind of moment. And therefore, there can be no discontinuity in the moment curve. So whatever is happening in here has to start at that point. That's the state of the beam when you arrive at the support point. And likewise, on this side, it has to start there. So what we do is we take our parabola and we say we're going to lower it down. So normally for a simple span beam, it would have started Actually, it would have started way out here. Um, but now it's been pulled down to begin at that point and that point. And we draw this curve and we see the cantilevers have introduced this negative moment, which is built up until we get to the supports. And then it begins to go back up again and eventually becomes quite positive and then comes back down and meets at this point again. This parabola has to be exactly the same one we drew that to because W is uniform all the way across here and the parabola depends on W. Once you've drawn a parabola, you have to use it everywhere for the rest of this problem. Okay, so if we pull the supports in even further, we'll line our parabola up at the end point here and at the end point there, we'll put our third parabola starting here and there and when it comes up, it turns out it goes to zero here. This result might be a little bit surprising until you realize that we have divided the beam up into A, 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 and A. In other words, we've divided it so that the supports are at the quarter points. That means this segment of beam is pretty much balanced on top of that. This segment is pretty much balanced on top of that. And so there's no requirement for any moment 
here to keep it in equilibrium. This is balanced there. That half is balanced there. And in the end, we have zero moment at the center. If we slide our supports in to the point that we just have one support at the center, these two parabolas come and meet there, and there is no between the supports to indicate this is a, is a profoundly uh, serious negative moment. In fact, this negative moment is equal in magnitude to the moment that we would have gotten for the simple span beam going from there to there. So in the book there are some drawings where a lot of these things get drawn on top of each other. Um, I happen to like this way of drawing, but sometimes it's uh, confusing. I'll present it here and you can decide when you do representations like this whether you want to draw all these drawings on top of each other or as a se sequence of separated drawings. But here we've got a uniform load and by the way in this case I drew it with W down below the theory being that this is all gravity load it's all downward therefore it's all negative so if we're doing a plot we'd actually draw that below uh, most people don't do that because they know the load sits on top of the beam. Uh, but from a graphic point of view, especially if you're thinking in terms of calculus and you want to integrate this load curve, the reactions are positive. These downward gravity forces would be negative and therefore occur below the zero line. That's a sort of technical mathematical and graphing point. Um, but the idea here is we have a uniform load. We're moving the supports in from the end, so I've attempted to graphically indicate the corresponding points. So that point corresponds to that, that point corresponds to that. And as you move inward, you get more and more negative moment as you slide along this curve and slide along that one. The negative moment as the cantilever gets longer and longer becomes more and more severe. It pulls down what's happening in between the supports. So there are two things happening, by the way. You're introducing more and more negative moment at the end, but the space between the supports is also getting smaller and smaller. So the positive moment between the supports is getting pulled down really rapidly by that dual effect. Um, when we reach 20.7% of the overall length as the length of the individual cantilevers, we reach an optimum where this negative moment is just equal to that positive moment and that would be the optimal configuration in terms of minimizing moment in the beam. If we slide them further out the positive moment dominates. If we slide the supports closer to the center the negative moment becomes larger and larger and this is the optimum that produces the minimum moment in the beam. This moment right here is substantially less than that moment right there. In other words, we have dramatically reduced the moment by sliding these supports in. Um, fact of the matter is, the impact on deflection is much more dramatic even than this. So there are a lot of benefits to putting these supports at the optimal location. On the other hand, this has to be weighed against all kinds of architectural considerations, and in the end, Structure is not a high enough part of the cost of a building that we will generally allow that to utterly dominate the design. Um, the only time you would do that is when you make the argument of we can be so efficient this way, we can create more space, more flexibility, and in the end it's better to just build the optimum than to fine tune it. Somewhere in there, by the way, sometimes that argument works Sometimes it's a fallacious argument, um, but the architect has to think through all these things in terms of the importance of the architectural objections, objectives, but also the economy of means relative to the structure. Okay, so we can do the same kind of thing for a single cantilever. We only have one of these parabolas at the end. It's lined up with the end here. Uh, then we have to have zero at this end and we have to uh, start at this point. So this parabola has to assure there's no discontinuity in the moment because there's no agent there that could produce that. Uh, 
So we have continuous moment, we have a cusp there where it changes direction, but it's absolutely continuous. So we have to maneuver this parabola down into this position so it goes through that point and through that point. Now this is a great time to point out something else. Always it's better to draw the moment curve first and then the shear curve second. And that sort of defies a lot of people's logic because they think mathematically, we start with this, we integrate it to get that, then we integrate that to get this. So the logical thing would be we work this out first, right? And that's true if you're doing calculus, you have to do that. But we're not doing calculus here. We're trying as fast as possible to create a graphic image of what's going on in the beam. And we want it to be accurate, but we're trying to do it in the quickest and dirtiest way. So why would you have to do the moment first? And the answer is it's totally deterministic. The only thing that's totally deterministic about this is what's happening out on the cantilever. Where this crossover occurs here, we don't know, but here's what we do know. We know that if we're integrating this to get that, then this is the derivative of that. And therefore we know that where the derivative or slope of this is zero, which is right at the top here, is where that has to go through zero. And it makes sense. We start off rapidly increasing moment, because we're accumulating a lot of area. And as we get closer and closer and closer to this point, the moment curve trails off and, or it's, it's uh, increasing less and less rapidly. And right here, it's not increasing at all because there's no area accumulating there. And as soon as we move into this negative area, we start going downward. So we, if we've carried our parabola along, and we have our center line marked, we can project that point up to there, and that tells us where the crossover is. Now, if everything was done to scale, really to scale, this RA would be equal to that because it's what's creating that, and then this discontinuity in the shear would be caused by that force, and therefore that force would be equal to that. In the original drawing of this, though, I didn't know what RB and RA were, and <coughs> I didn't really want to, do, to be bothered with that much detail, so I just started off drawing my moment diagram and then my shear diagram. And now if I was going to redo this, uh, I'd go back and I'd say, well, I'm going to take that length and increase RB so it's equal to that length. So we have diagrams on top of diagrams. Here we have the optimum in that this negative moment is just equal to that positive moment. The benefits are not as dramatic for the single cantilever, but the optimum for the single cantilever occurs at 29%. So it was 20.7% for the double cantilevers, 29% for our single cantilevers. Okay. Um, <clears throat> There's a video that follows this that talks about how to create a parabola. And for those of you who are interested in that, you can follow that. Uh, and then after that, there's a video that talks about uh, sort of step-by-step -step process of moving these things around. Whereas when I went through this, I kind of just put it all on one drawing and it's done there. Uh, to help those of you who are maybe struggling a little bit with this idea, it would be really nice to do it one step at a time and so we're going to do that as soon as I can get that video cranked out. That ends our video from chapter 6, section 1, subsection 1, our second video from that subsection dealing with shear and moment for cantilevers and for continuous beams with cantilevers.